depending upon the industry and depending upon the product and or service that you're providing, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't there different laws per each state that where you may be taxable for your service and or product uh, in this state and not that? And you know how, how do you try to mitigate that component? Sure. Um, you know, a perfect example of what you're talking about is when it comes to like software, um, or SaaS software as a service or digital products or data. Um, certain states will impose sales tax, whether it's on electronically delivered software, software as a service via, you know, delivery via cloud, or even let's say like data processing or information services. And what often happens is Right, there are some states that are going to look to where first receipt of the service occurs. Maybe there's some states that are going to look to billing address. Maybe there's some states that are going to allow what's called multiple points of use sourcing. So let's say that data or that software or that SAS may be ordered from a location in Pennsylvania, but that company that ordered it in Pennsylvania has workers using it all over. Is there a way to break up those receipts so that the sales are essentially sourced to other jurisdictions, maybe jurisdictions where there's no sales tax collection requirement because there is a nexus. Um, and so that's part of you know an analysis that we do regularly in terms of looking at the different rules that are in place. You know, just like income tax, where you know there's different rules based on we talked about customer location, costs of performance, where services are performed, where products are delivered, is the same way there's different rules for sales tax sourcing. And not all the states, like we talked about, use the same rules. So sometimes you might get into the situation where you may have like a double tax situation in which you try to get credit for tax paid, even whether it's at the income tax level or the sales tax level. Um, and at the corporate level, that's why apportionment comes into play, income apportionment. So using different apportionment formulas, whether based on property payroll sales or sales in the state alone, to basically break up the income to try to avoid those double tax situations. And just because you have, say, a sales tax nexus in a state, does that necessarily mean that you're going to have an in ta- income tax nexus with that state as well? Not necessarily. So, you know, the one sort of thing that has changed is the answer I would say used to be yes, with the exception of the rule PL 8672 that we talked about, with the idea being that pre-2018 and in some states it's a little different but i would say pre-2018 there was still this general sort of physical presence requirement based on a supreme court case referred to as quill Mm -hmm. but then in 2018 the supreme court took up a case wayfair v south dakota which essentially blessed the concept of states imposing sales tax nexus based on dividing a certain amount of revenue so in the past where you don't have to have a physical presence you probably had income tax nexus unless you were subject to PLA 6072. Now you can be in a situation where you can exceed that economic nexus threshold, usually $100,000 for sales tax nexus, but maybe the state hasn't passed an economic nexus law for income tax, you may not have nexus. So it's not necessarily a certainty that one goes with the other. However, I will say that um, usually, and in the, you know, in the jurisprudence and case law, income tax nexus has always been thought to be sort of a lower threshold, a lower standard than sales tax nexus. So the thought process is, if you have sales tax nexus under due process and commerce clause considerations, which are the governing laws under the Constitution, that you know likely you probably will have income tax as well. But it's not a definitive certainty.